All righty. Good at well, afternoon now. Good afternoon, everybody. How you doing? Oh, geez. Hello. How are you? Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm well. Thanks for asking. I'm Amber, uh, Assistant Director of Public Engagement here at the National World War II Museum. And I want to thank each and every one of you all, since we had to pack the house today, uh, for a very special uh, lunchbox, two-part lunchbox lecture today. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to give a few annou brief announcements real quick. First of all, for those of you in the room, please silence your cell phones. Please turn them on vibrate, turn it off, turn it on silent. Any you know decision you choose, either way, we just don't want to hear that phone <coughs> ring during the presentation, please. Um, some upcoming of, uh, events. The second part of this two-part Lunchbox lecture is going to be next Wednesday, uh, the 24th. So, um, if you are... Is that next Wednesday? Yes. It is? Okay, great. I'm glad I have my, my, my colleagues here to tell me. Yeah, the 24th. So, that will be again in this room, same time, same place. So, uh, October, um, April 24th here in the Orientation Center. Um, we have an upcoming lecture uh, on, in our Faith and Wartime series by Duncan R. Williams. That's going to be in the Louisiana Memorial Pavilion uh, on April 23rd. So please join us for that. You do have to pre-register for that, but it is free and open to the public. And then lastly, on that same evening, April 23rd, we have our Dinner with a Curator, which topic this week or next week is, um, is uh, Josephine Baker. So that'll be a really great dinner with a curator talk um, that you do have to pre-register for, and that is a small cost of being associated with that because you do get dinner, which is a good dinner from what I know. Um, so uh, please go online to check any upcoming events and register for things on our website at nationalww2museum.org. So today's presentation is streaming live on Facebook and will be available for viewing in its entirety on the museum's Facebook page, which of course is WWII Museum on facebook.com and then later um, via the other uh, museum channels so feel free to share that stream with uh, any of your facebook friends who might be interested in in it and if you're watching today from live stream hello and feel free to offer a question to our speaker in the comments section so now that all of my housekeeping is out of the way i'm going to get out of the way of our speaker today who is mr herb miller uh, who is a museum volunteer extraordinaire herb how long have you been volunteering at the museum uh, nine years nine years so uh, a long time, much longer than I've been here. So, Herb, please speak. Thank you. Thank all of you for coming out here today. You're wondering what that is. Well, first of all, welcome. Uh, this is the first of a two-part presentation uh, covering the Enigma machine used by the German military for sending uh, incisive messages out into the field for the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, uh, and how the cipher was broken by the Allies. Uh, let me begin first today um, by thanking MS Royal Antiques for bringing a real Enigma machine uh, for you guys to look at uh, after the presentation. It's an operational machine. Uh, I want to thank in particular Mr. James Gillis, who is here uh, with, with MS Ralph. Also on the table, you'll see some envelopes. They have a little bit of description of Enigma machine, and then there's a brochure about a free uh, presentation they have going on there at the museum, or rather at the antique shop today. So this first presentation covers the Enigma machine itself, its invention, uh, the various components machine of the machine and how they work together, how the Germans programmed it, uh, the variables in the programming system, why the Nazis felt that the machine uh, could not be broken, and changes made to the machine from its invention until the end of the war. Now, the best kept secret of World War II uh, involved the breaking of the various uh, military uh, and diplomatic codes but of the Axis powers by the Allied powers. Uh, in uh, this was such a secret that it was kept secret and didn't become public until 1974, nearly 30 years after the end of the war. ULTRA was the designation given to this uh, type of code breaking uh, in June of 1941, uh, and it was involved with all wartime intelligence uh, breaking of high-level high level encrypted 
uh, enemy radio and teleprinter communications. Uh, basically, it was broken at the uh, government code and cipher school at Bletchley Park in England. Now, Ultra eventually became the st standard designation for all such breaks. The name arose because the intelligence was considered more secret than the then uh, highest level of security, which was top secret, and therefore it was ultra secret. Now the term ultra has often been used simply for the breaking of the Enigma machine, but it actually applied to all such breaking of subcodes and ciphers uh, used by the Axis powers and the German High Command. Now there is a difference between a code and a cipher. Uh, a code is simply a substitution of one character for another with the same character or symbol always representing the same letter each time. Uh, to decode the message, you simply need a single code key. Uh, for example, here the code message, uh, hello everyone, you can look uh, for the letter H, you see below that is the letter Q, the letter E, below that is the letter L, and so on, so you get the coded message there. Now note that each time the letter E appears in the original message, uh, it codes uh, to the letter L. Now to decode it, you simply reverse the code. You'd come down here and you see the letter Q goes to H, the letter L goes to uh, the letter E, and so on, and you would be able to decode it. Now codes are pretty simple to break. Uh, basically what you do is you count the occurrence of each letter in the code, and the most common occurrence in the English language is gonna be the letter E. That's going to be followed by the letters A, R, I, O, T, N, and S in that order. Now, they won't always appear exactly in that order, but that's a pretty good start. And once you've broken a few words, you can sort of fill in the blanks on some of the words that uh, don't have complete words. And you can break the codes fairly simple. Now, a cipher is completely different and much more complex. Uh, I've put together a very simple cipher code here. Basic, uh, basically, all I am doing uh, is, oops, sorry about that, go back. All I'm doing uh, is sliding this code one letter to the left for each letter. For example, under the letter B, under the first, you see the letter K. Well, that's moved under the letter A for the second letter of the alphabet. Similarly, the letter uh, M is under the letter C, but by the third letter, it's moved under the letter A. So the cipher remains the same, it just loops. Well, if you were to encode the message, uh, hello all, this is what it would end up looking like. And note that while the letter L appears four times in the original message, a different cipher letter represents it each time it occurs in the cipher. And the letter G appears twice in the cipher, but represents a different letter in the original message each time it appears. So as you can imagine, a cipher is much more complex to break than is a code. Now, most people use the term cipher and code interchangeably, and quite frankly, I'm going to do the same during the course of the presentation. But now you do know what the difference is. The, the Enigma machine was the brainchild of German electrical engineer Arthur Scherbius. Uh, his firm, uh, founded uh, by the name Scherbius and Ritter, uh, patented ideas for a cipher machine in February of 1918. Arthur Scherbius's Enigma machine was capable of transcribing ciphered information uh, in the hope of interesting commercial companies uh, into secure communications between their various offices around Germany. In 1923, he set up his Cypher Machines Corporation in Berlin to manufacture his product. Now, the first machine to be built was the Enigma A machine in 1923, and it had a lot of technical problems. Many of these were addressed by the Enigma B machine in 1924. The commonality between the A and B machine was that the ciphered information and then, of course, the deciphering uh, went to a printout similar to looks like you see typewriter keyboard, the old keys that you used to have. Uh, it fixed uh, most of the problems with Enigma A, but it was still very bulky, uh, and it actually had uh, four rotors that you can see here on the side. Now, later came the Enigma C machine. Uh, this was producing its output on a series of lights that would show up on the light board uh, over here. This is a typical commercial machine that was sold uh, throughout Germany. It was much lighter and more portable than the previous versions. Uh, it cost about an eighth of the price at 1,000 Reichsmarks. A special version of Enigma C was built for the Navy, the first military branch to adopt Enigma in 1926. This was followed by the Enigma D machine, which is 
Bush, uh, we don't have a picture of that, but we're going to get to the military one in just a moment. Uh, and that was the first machine that allowed the rotors inside the machine to change position. They were on a wheel, you could take them out and move them around. Prior to that, the rotors, the same rotor was stationary at all times as far as its location in the machine. Uh, now, later, um, the reflector was movable as well. It could be changed. And the German Army adopted a version of the Enigma D machine in 1928. Now, this is the Enigma I machine. And it was first adopted by the Army for military use in 1932, and the Navy followed uh, soon thereafter. Uh, this is basically the most general form of the Enigma machine, uh, you frequently call it Enigma M, used by the German military throughout the war. Now, you'll notice a difference between this and the <coughs> prior machines we were looking at, and that is the addition of a plug board, which we'll get into details about a little bit later. But the plug board significantly increased the security of the coded messages. Now, other countries also used Enigma machines. The Italian Navy uh, adopted a commercial version as the Navy Cipher D, and the Spanish used the commercial version during their Civil War. Uh, these machines were unstackered. They did not have the plug board down here, uh, and they, their codes were actually broken by the British. Now, the Germans would encode a message using uh, a, uh, using the Enigma machine, and they would send the enciphered message uh, to the recipient out in the field. When the recipient set up his machine exactly the same way as the sender did at the beginning of the message, then he would type in uh, the ciphered message, and the unenciphered message would print out or come out on the light board. So typically there would be uh, two people involved with sending and receiving. One person would write the message, and then he would type it, as he typed, another person would write down what lights lit up. That would be the message. The message that occurred from the lights lighting up would be the one that would be sent in the field. The gentleman in the field would get, again, two people working, one typing on the keyboard, the other uh, reading the lights that lit up, which would then be the unencoded message. Uh, these signals were generally sent by radio or Morse code, uh, so they were over the airways, and the Allies were able to intercept these messages, although initially not able to tell what they meant. Now, the three main differences between the keyboard on an Enigma machine and a keyboard on a typewriter. Number one, you see no more case letters. There's no shift key. Number two, there are no numbers. And number three, there is no space bar. So how did the Germans deal with this? Well, they used letter codes uh, for the various uh, types of punctuation. The Army and Air Force might use ZZ for a comma in a decoded message. The Navy would use X for a period, Y for a comma, etc. Numbers were written out as words. Zero was null, N-U-L-L. -L. The number three would have been dry, D-R-E-I, which is the German word uh, for the number three. Uh, so that's how they took care of the problem of, of no, no punctuation on the key <coughs> and how they dealt with the numbers. Now, I'm going to give you a very uh, simple uh, explanation. Again, basically the operator would write down the message, type it in, somebody would record it, and it would then be sent off uh, to be decoded uh, by the recipient. Now, again, one thing that's important to note is the three windows here uh, at the top of the machine. Uh, those windows allowed one letter in the Enigma wheel to be visible uh, to the operator. Uh, and uh, there are three rotors typically in the machine, as we have in our machine on display here. Um, and note that the operator is able to change those rotors without opening up the machine. He can use a little wheel there to change the letters. We're going to talk later about he, how he set up the machine uh, to send a particular message and how the recipient, therefore, would set up his machine in the same way. Now, Enigma had a significant design flaw. Uh, as each letter was entered, the machine would make an internal adjustment. And that adjustment would involve the rotation of the rightmost wheel one letter, which would completely change the code, as we'll demonstrate in a few minutes. Now, for example, if you press the letter A, the first time the letter E might light up on the plug board. If you press it again, maybe the letter J would light up, and again the letter L. And while there are only 26 letters in the alphabet, the patterns of lights would be different all the way through. In fact, the pattern would not repeat itself until you had pressed the same letter 
over 17,500 times. And since messages were limited to 250 characters, the possibility of the machine reverting back to its original position during the sending of a particular message was nil. Now, the other problem that the Enigma machine had, uh, which was very uh, critical to the breaking of the code, uh, was that a letter could never code to itself. If you were to press the letter R starting this morning at 8 o'clock and continue to press the letter R every second till 5 o'clock this afternoon, the letter R would never light up on the plug board, I mean on the light board. So that was a significant security flaw which the British were able uh, to, to overcome. The lecture next week, same time, same place, uh, is going to be about how the British broke the code. Today's lecture is limited to strictly to the Enigma machine itself. So I'm going to give you a very brief description, uh, description of the function of each part of the machine, and then I will go into more detail about each part. Now, the machine consists of a battery, a keyboard, a plug board, an entry wheel, <coughs> rotors, usually three, later on the Navy used four, a reflector, and a light board. Those are the various components uh, of the machine. Now, how did the letter route through Enigma? Well, I'm going to give you a very simple explanation. We're going to use a very simple Enigma machine. It only has four letters, A, S, D, and F, and it's got uh, uh, one plug, the letters S and D are steckered. They're combined together on the plug board. So simple operation is the operator comes in and he presses the letter A on the keyboard. It goes down to the plug board, and since the letter A is not steckered, that is, it is not connected by a plug to any other letter, it leaves the plug board as the letter A. And that's where it will enter into the entry wheel, number four. Now, we'll talk about the entry wheel later on, but the letter A was at the very top of the entry wheel. If you type the letter M, it might be near the bottom of the entry wheel, but it enters at that point, and the entry wheel doesn't change the letter. It goes in as A, it comes out as A, and it goes to one of the three rows. And the red lines you see are the routings to the rotors. Each time it goes through a rotor, the letter changes to a different letter. So it goes through each rotor and then it goes into number six, which is uh, the reflector. Now it's important to remember as we go through the presentation uh, that for each rotor in the machine, any of the 26 letters of the alphabet uh, could appear visible in that little window at the top of the machine. And the routers rotated in a method we'll talk about later. Uh, and as we'll see, the rotation of even a single rotor by even one letter will completely change uh, the coding of the machine. Now, the reflector received uh, the letter coming off of number five, the leftmost reflector. And uh, it would change the letter one more time. Now, each letter in the reflector was paired to one and only one letter. So for example, the letter A was paired to the letter D, and it meant that the letter D was paired to the letter A. So if it entered the reflector at the letter D, it would come out as the letter A from the reflector. If it entered the reflector from the letter A, it would come out as the letter D. It was this the part of the machine uh, that allowed the machine to encrypt things, but it also kept any letter from repeating its uh, showing up on the whiteboard when you press that key on the keyboard. Um, so continuing with our example, after it's been changed going through the various rotors, it changes again as it goes back through three more times. It hits the entry wheel, and in our example, it's going to come out of the entry wheel as the letter S. So the letter S now enters the plug board. Well, S is steckered or connected to the letter D. So instead of the letter S going to the light board, the letter is going to be changed to D, and D is going to light up on the whiteboard. So that's a very simple explanation of how a letter is routed through a uh, the, the keyboard uh, is very straightforward. Um, basically, whatever letter you enter on the keyboard is what goes down to the plug board. Uh, here we're looking at a picture of an unstuckered plug board. Um, the addition of the plug board significantly improved the security of Enigma. Uh, this is one version. You can see both letters and numbers uh, on the plug board itself. 
in front of the plugs. Uh, I have seen versions where there are machines that just have letters in alphabetical order, or have numbers in alphabetical order, or have letters in the order of the German uh, keyboard. So there are all kinds of different machines. Now what I found fairly odd uh, was that the Army and Air Force plug boards had letters, but their rotors that you're using the machine had numbers on them. And what was equally odd was the Navy uh, plug board had, had numbers, but their entry wheels had letters. Uh, I guess they wanted people that could both uh, read and write and do, do math and stuff, I don't know. But that was what, so, something I found very unusual about the machine. Now during the war, uh, the Germans would use 10 plugs uh, to connect 20 letters, each plug connecting uh, two letters together. Uh, so there would be a 20, total of 20 stuckered letters and six letters that would be unstuckered. So here's a fully plugged Enigma machine. <coughs> Look careful, you can see the letters J and K are not plugged, they are unstuckered. If they entered the plug board from the keyboard as a J or K, J or K it would exit the plug board as a J or K. You can see the holes, uh, but you can't make out the letters uh, of the other unstuckered letters. Any other letter that is stuckered would enter the plug board and leave by, its, by a letter of its paired uh, point. Now, <clears throat> the entry wheel is a sort of an interesting little animal. Whatever letter came out of the plug board would go into the entry wheel at that point. Uh, the military version of Enigma, uh, the entry wheel was a simple alphabet going around A to Z. So the very top was the letter A, then B, C, D, all the way around where we see the letter W. If it came out of the plug board as the letter A, it would enter the entry wheel at that point. If it came out of D, it would go in at that point, etc., uh, etc. Et um, The entry wheel itself was stationary, it did not rotate, and the location again of a given letter on the wheel would determine where it would enter the rightmost rotor uh, in the Enigma machine. So, let's look at the rotors. So this is an ex exploded view of the rotor, of all the various components. Uh, a couple of key features of the rotors that we want to point out. This is the internal wiring of the rotor. And that stays stationary from one side of the rotor uh, to the other side. However, this little animal here is a ring. And that ring has the alphabet on it. And you can rotate that alphabet to any singular position uh, on the machine at any time. And with the impact of that uh, is pretty important, as we'll talk about uh, in just a few minutes. Um, the setting of that, when you move that wing around to a different location, is called the ring setting. And these are used uh, by the, uh, you also have over here, you can see a little notch in the wheel right there, that's the letter J. Uh, that notch is what turns the Enigma rotor. Um, it turns the rotor adjacent to it. Whenever that notch is at the top of the machine, the next time that rotor rotates, it also rotates the rotor to its left. So the first rotor rotates with every keystroke. The one on the right, anytime you enter a keystroke, that rotates one letter. When its notch gets to the very top, and you enter another letter, it's going to rotate the wheel in the middle. If it ever occurs where the notch is on the wheel in the middle, and it rotates, it will also rotate the wheel to the left of it. So all three wheels during the course of, a, of a, a putting in a message could rotate and, and, and scramble the entire communication uh, of how the Enigma would output a letter. Now, the wheel on the left didn't matter where its notch was, it would not rotate the reflector. The reflector was stationary <coughs> as well. Uh, let's see here. Oh, so this is the wiring diagram of Enigma Rotor 1 with the ring setting at A, it's, it's, its base position. And what you see here is if it enters the letter A, the blue line, the second row is the letter that it comes out at. So if it enters at the letter A, it's going to come out at the letter E. If it enters on the way back through the machine, 
It's coming back again from the refractor going the other way. Let's say it enters at the letter N, it goes out as the letter K. So these wires stayed the same. Now, the letter, this is internal. It never changes. But the letter on the wheel that represents those letters could change. In other words, when you move the uh, reflector, excuse me, the ring setting to letter B, <coughs> now B on top of the machine is going to encode messages as if A were on top of the machine with no ring setting. Same thing if you set it to the, to the letter K, for example. The K would, would cite the machine. Uh, you put K on top of the machine, it would give you the same output as if A were on top of the machine with no ring setting otherwise. Now, initially the Germans had only three rotors, which could be arranged in any order. Uh, however, prior to the war, all service branches would select those three rotors from a group of five rotors. And eventually the Navy went to eight different rotors. So you would pick three rotors out of the eight uh, to put into the machine. <coughs> or three rotors out of five if you were Army or Air Force. Now the operator would place the rotors in the machine and he would set one of the letters or numbers on top of the rotor visible through the machine window cover. Uh, Enigma's complexity and its cryptographic security came from several rotors in series, further complicated by the regular skipping of the right rotor and during the course of a message, always the middle rotor. If you went at least anywhere between 1 and 26 letters entered, the middle rotor would rotate. Now looking at the right view of the rotor here, you see the Roman numeral number 1. That tells you that it is rotor number 1. Uh, the, ro the rest of the rotors were numbered 2 through 8 using Roman numerals. On the left view of the rotor, again you see the notch. That again, when that notch is, the letter at that notch is on top of the machine, the next keyboard will rotate the wheel immediately to its left. Now, each rotor had its notch in a different location. So, rotor 1 the notch was a Q. This was not affected by the ring setting. Because the, the rotor would always rotate at Q on the ring. So the second one was E, V, J, and Z. And then the Navy rotors, uh, when you got down to rotors 6, 7, and 8, those would have been Navy rotors. And uh, they had different letters on them. Uh, but, so these are the various rotor settings for the ring settings. Excuse me, for the notch. So this is the basic wiring of each of the rotors and how they would be reflected in a given letter. So again, this is based on the ring setting at A, the base, the base setup of the machine. And you see router one with A on top gives you an E. Rotor number two gives you an A. Very similar to the same, the same letter. Rotor three, a B. Rotor four, an E. Rotor five, a V, and on. The same thing over here, go down the letters. Any, basically, any rotor is going to give you a different letter coming out of it than will a different rotor. So, uh, when making its return trip to the rotor, uh, it would actually go in on this line, on the coded <coughs> line, and then come out on the alphabetic line. So again, the letter N coming out uh, of, would go to the letter K on the other side when, when the machine is coming back from the reflector. Now, these are the reflectors that they use. Uh, reflector B was almost <coughs> always used throughout the course of the war. So very seldom would the, would the breakers, uh, code breakers at Bunchwick Park have to simulate anything but reflector B. Uh, reflector C was introduced in 1943. However, it was very seldom used. So again, uh, B was the common one. Now, what you notice about the reflector is it is self-reciprocal. If it comes in at the letter A, it goes out at the letter Y. If it comes in at the letter Y, it goes out as the letter A. Same thing, D and H, H and D. So there's only one letter that each letter in the rotor is connected to, and so that uh, each letter in the reflector is connected to. Uh, when the Navy uh, went, to, uh, went, went to a four-rotor machine, uh, they had excuse me, they had two new reflectors, the thin B and the thin C. Uh, and of course, Fletcher Park had to figure out how to break that code uh, as well. 
Now the ring setting was set, you would spin this, uh, spin this outer wheel, and if the Army, you would lock it in there with the Navy, you had a little bit different locking mechanism. But that would indicate uh, where the ring setting is. Now note again, the Army wheel has numbers on it, so four would have been the letter D. And obviously A was number one, Z was number uh, 26. So we're gonna look at the impact of the ring setting in just a moment. But first, let's see what happens when we make a very, very minor change uh, to the Enigma machine. <clears throat> now, I happen to have an Enigma simulator on my, on my computer, and I set it up uh, as a Navy machine with the rotors 3, 2, 1 from left to right. All of the ring settings set at A, and I coded in the message, Welcome to the World War II Museum. And you can see how this coded out, set up like that. Well, I then made one minor change. I took this wheel right here, the rightmost rotor, I changed it to the letter B at the start of the message. And remember, that wheel is going to rotate one letter every single time as you go through the message. Look at the new message. There are basically only two letters that line up, and that is strictly coincidence. There could have been none that lined up. So just by <laughs> making a very minor change, changing one wheel, one letter, you get a completely different message when you type in the message. Now the ring setting has two impacts. It's best, best shown by this. With the ring setting at A, again looking at rotor number one, these are how the letters match up. If I move it to D, you see the E is no longer under A. The E is now under the letter D. If I move it to K, you see that the E is now under the letter K. So it does not change the order. In fact, I put these five letters in red so you can see if they stay in the same order. But it does change the relative position. So for example, if A were on top of your machine and your ring setting was an A, then you would press A and it would come out of that rotor as an E. On the other hand, if D was on top of the machine and you and it entered the rotor as A, it would come out as R. And if K were on top of the machine and you entered the rotor of A, it would come out as X. So again, we, we just a minor change in the rotor of moving that ring setting to a different letter completely changes the entire encryption of the message. So it, it shifts the alphabet by the number of letters it is from A. From A to D is three letters, so the alphabet shifted three letters. A to K is ten letters, so it shifted ten letters. That ring is on the outside of the rotor. Nothing internally changes other than the relative relationship of the alphabet. Now, from a cipher breaking standpoint, one might surmise that the ring setting really doesn't do anything uh, except move the alphabet. And then, in fact, you could uh, simulate the same ring setting, uh, or the, the effort with the same ring, because of the ring setting, you're going to get the same alphabet coming out. And that would be true up to a point. Let's look at what happens with the ring setting uh, if we go back to uh, our, our simulated uh, message. <clears throat> Again, uh, the letter visible in the right window, uh, I'll explain that for you in a moment. Whenever you press the key on the keyboard, this right rotor would rotate, and it would rotate before any enciphering is done. So when they on top of the machine, if you press any key on the keyboard, B goes to the machine, and that's the letter that's going to be enciphered. Uh, as it goes through the routers uh, in that particular rotor. So with AAA on top of the machine, uh, again, this is the same message we saw before. Uh, Spell out just like that. If I move it to K on top of the machine, and I put K rotor here instead of the letter A, you see that the first five letters are identical. So has it changed anything? Well, not at that point. You know, the B, N, B, F, N, L, Z, K, first six letters are identical. But what happens to the seventh letter? I get a J here and I got an H there. I get a P here, I got an M there. Why did that happen? Because when the letter R uh, ends up on the top, the letter Q is on top, the machine flips to the letter R, the middle rotor rotated one time. And so again, now we have a completely different set instead of 
the letter A being up here, the letter B is down in the middle rotor. So what the ring setting did was change the relative letter at which the machine would rotate. And until you got to that rotation of the first letter, it could encrypt exactly the same way. So from a cipher breaking standpoint, the ring setting would appear to be a huge complication. Even if you had the correct rotor order, uh, you knew all of the plug board settings, unless you had the correct ring setting, uh, your machine uh, would not produce the unencoded message. Even if all the letter orders were correct, showing on top at the start, all the plug board connections are made correctly. So the combination of several rotors in ever-changing positions relative to each other, uh, coupled with the ring settings and the plug board combinations, is what made the encryption so complex. So we've now seen how simply changing a visible letter in the rightmost window from A to B completely changes the enciphered message. And we've seen how changing the ring setting can completely change the enciphered message. So how many different ways can we set up an Enigma machine? If you were trying to break the code at Blackwood Park, what would you have to consider as a possible number of machine settings? Well, let's go through the math here. Well, we're going to do this with Army and Air Force, as opposed to Navy, because they had five wheels to choose from. Having five wheels to choose from, there are 60 different ways that three wheels can be selected and put in the machine uh, in varying orders. Uh, the top letter of each rotor can change. There are 26 letters on each rotor. So we have 26 cubed, or 17,526 possible different rotor settings at the start of the machine. Now the ring setting, as I mentioned, the ring setting on the leftmost wheel didn't matter. It didn't move anything. But the ring setting in the middle wheel and the rightmost rotor uh, did matter. So we've got 26 squared, which is 676 ways of setting up ring settings. We did have two reflectors, but I'm choosing to use only one, again, because the reflector B was almost always used in the machine. And if we multiply these numbers together, we get a pretty, pretty large number. Over 712 million, close to 713 million different ways of setting up the machine just by changing the rotors and the ring setting on the machine. That is not even the tip of the iceberg because we have not yet considered the plug board. Now, the equation of possible ways of setting up the plug board is a little complex. Those of you that are, are familiar with math, <coughs> equations up there, don't worry about it, I'll solve it for you. <laughs> um, and you see, interestingly, using all of the plug board connections uh, is actually uh, less number of op options than it is using uh, 10, 11, or 12. Interestingly, the optimum number for giving you the maximum number of possibilities is 11, but the Germans chose to use 10. So even so, using that 10, we get a number that is basically uh, over 150 trillion possible ways to plug up the plug board using 10 cores. So, if we go to that and we look carefully, uh, what is the total combination? Well, we have to multiply the plug board combinations by the rotor combinations, and we come up with a pretty astounding number. That number is 107,000 million, million, million ways that you can initially set up the Enigma machine. So no wonder the Germans felt that breaking the code would be impossible. Now I realize that number is absolutely meaningless to all of us. We can't imagine that many dollars, that many pennies or anything. So I'm going to give you a way to put that in perspective. We're going to take uh, sheets of copy paper and lay them flat, just like this. The distance from the Earth to the Sun is over 90 million miles. If we took 107,000 million, million, million sheets of copy paper lying flat, it would reach from the Earth to the Sun 70 million times. <laughs> So 
So imagine you're a German soldier out in the field and you've just received a radio communication uh, that Erwin Rommel is sending you a very important message. And you now have to figure out which of the 107,000 million, million, million ways uh, he set up his Enigma machine so that you can decode that message. Obviously that was not the case. The Germans told you how to set up your machine each day. Now, as a reminder, if the receiver set up his Enigma machine exactly the same way at the start of the encoding process as the sender did, the light bulb would light up the unencoded message when he entered the coded message on the keyboard. <clears throat> now, to further complicate things uh, in breaking of Enigma, each operator selected which letters would be appear on the top of the machine in the little windows each time he sent a coded message. And if he sent a second coded message during that day, he would have to change that to another set of letters. Well, he had to tell the receiving letters which letters to use. So how did he do that? Uh, and these procedures, by the way, rather than making the machine more complicated to break, actually made the cipher easier to break, as I'll discuss next time. So let's look at how a sender would send up his message. Now the Army and Navy had an actually much simpler method uh, for encoding stuff. Uh, each branch of the service would issue a code sheet similar to this uh, with the codes for an entire month. And, and the settings of the machine changed every single day. You <coughs> note that day 31, the top, last day of the month is at the top of the sheet. And that was so as you went down, number one being at the bottom of the sheet, and if you finish with that day, you could cut that off and destroy it. So at the end of the month, you're just left with a few, few uh, numbers at the top to code with. So Tag is the German word for day. So this is the 31st day of the month. Malzenlage is the ring, is the, is the word for rotor. So we're going to use rotors one, two, and four, five in that order from left to right. The ring stellog is the ring setting. So Ring number one is going to have a ring setting of six. Ring uh, rotor number two is going to have a ring setting of 22. And a rotor number three, we put the ring setting at 14. We now put those rotors onto the spindle and we insert it into the machine. Now we have to plug the plug board. Well, that's what the Steckerberg conductor is. <laughs> P and O are connected together. M and L are put together. I and U to together, etc. down towards the end. Now, we've not yet spoken about the King Grumpen because that is actually not part of the machine itself. Uh, these four letter groups of three letters are characteristics groups used to, at the start of the message, to tell the receiver which day the message was sent. This is important. If I'm sending you a message and I start typing it at 11.50 p.m., by the time I send it, it's the next day. And when you get that message, if you set up your machine for the next day setting, it ain't going to work. So it's important for you to know which day setting to use to decode my message. Now each operator would choose which letters would be visible on the top of the machine for each message he sent. So this is how it worked. First thing the operator would do was set up his machine as we talked about with the correct wheel order, the correct ring setting, and the correct plug board connection. Now, to identify the day of the month, he would use one of these King groupings. And in our example that we have down here, he chose the King grouping EXX. He then chooses two random letters to put with it. In our case, he chose the letters TV. So TV EXX. He could just as well have put the T at the front and the V at the back, or both the T and the V at the back, as long as he kept the letters EXS together. So when the gentleman received this coded message, this part is not coded. And so the first thing he sees is an EXS are together. He goes to King Grouping. He tells to set up his machine for day 31. So that's how he knew what day to set the machine on. Most of this first line is sent unencoded. U6Z is the guy who's receiving the message. DE is from. C is being sent by the person whose code name is C. It's being sent at 1510, which is 310 p.m., and there are 49 letters in the code. Now, 
The operator then sets what's known as a random basic position and a random key message. He chooses for his random basic position the letters EHZ. So the receiving operator gets all of his first line, he puts in the wheels, he puts in the ring settings, he puts in the plug board, and he goes to the top of his machine and from left to right, he reads the wheel order as EHZ on top of the machine. Now, the person sending the coded message has selected the letters XWB as his random message key. And on his machine, he types in the letters XWB. When he does that, it translates to TBX. So the receiver sets up his machine exactly the same way with EHZ on top, and he types in this coded message TBS, and that gives him back the random message key of XWB. He then moves his wheels to XWB, and then he types in the entire message. So again, the operator has told him what day I'm sending my message, I, what letters I had at the top of the machine when I started coding the message, and now the guy can set up his machine exactly the same way, and he can decode the message. Now, as I mentioned earlier, messages were limited to 250 characters for security purposes. Uh, so if you had to send additional messages uh, to complete his comments, you would have to select a new Ken Grumpin from one of the four Ken Grumpins of the day. Uh, and he would also select a new random basic message and a new random message key. Now, this may seem like a lot of work to set up a message, but it was all about security. Now, think for a minute. If you were trying to break Enigma and you correctly guess the plug board wiring, correctly guess which loaders were present, and correctly guess the ring settings, you still had to deal with the 17,576 possible litter combinations that could appear on the three wheels in the top of the window. And these were changed with every single message that was sent. Now, despite the complexity of the Army and the Air Force procedure for coding the wheel orders, the Navy procedure was even much more complex. I'm not going to get into it, but in addition to having eight wheels from which to choose, uh, instead of five from the beginning, uh, their procedures for sending the message uh, included selecting a very complex trigram using tables that were called bigram tables, and then the receiver had to interpret that and backtrack that into the original message code. Now, the Navy books with the codes on them for the day, and this, the settings of the day, were printed with a special red ink that would smear when it got wet. So if a Navy ship was captured, uh, about to be captured, about to be sunk, the first thing they would do is throw all the code books overboard. So then when they were captured, it would just smear in red ink and nobody could read them. So now you have a very basic understanding of Enigma as it was used by the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy. However, there were other versions of Enigma machines uh, used by the Germans. Uh, the Navy went to a four-rotor machine uh, with the choice of two uh, additional rotors and uh, two uh, different reflectors than those used in the three-rotor machine. Uh, this machine was introduced for the U-boats in February of 1942 and caused great concern for the British code rotors. In fact, it took them 10 months to break into uh, this Navy code, which they codenamed Shark. During that period, uh, German U-boats would, uh, at times, destroy up to 30% of the shipments uh, in a convoy coming over from the United States to Europe. When they broke the code, they were able to tell where the U-boats were going to be and route the shipping around them. And the success of the U-boat dropped to about 5% of, of the material coming over. Also, because they had broken the code and they knew where the U-boats were, uh, they could send out planes and spot them and send ships in and planes to destroy them. Now the Enigma uh, for the Abwar, the German Military Intelligence Division, or their Secret Service, it used only three rotors, but it had different wirings than those used for the fighting forces, and it had multiple turnover notches on each of its rotors. Uh, later they also used a four rotor variant. Also they had different wirings for different sections of the Abwar. The German railway uh, had its own Enigma wiring system. Uh, and there were other German coding machines. The uh, most, most uh, 
best known was the Lorenz machine, uh, which actually had 12 rotors in it. Now, initially the Germans changed their rotor selection quarterly, uh, but they increased that difficulty, and then by the start of the war, uh, and actually in October 1936, they went to daily changes of the, the coding and how to set up the machine. Now, several important improvements were made to Enigma, uh, various branches of the military uh, throughout the war. However, they were generally not used because there were either not enough of that type of change available or it was too complex to use. Uh, again, we mentioned the second reflector, but it was very seldom used. A rewirable reflector uh, was introduced by the Air Force, uh, in, uh, and it was very, very seldom used. Uh, also, because the 1944 it was late in the war, they couldn't get enough production out and get them out to the machines. Uh, the Air Force developed a machine that would make the plug board uh, basically rewirable to any one of 40 different sets of positions simply by turning a knob. Uh, the use of this device was known at Bletchley Park as the Red Key, uh, and it was actually broken a few days after it began installation. The gap filling wheel in developed in 1943 could have been the most dangerous development uh, regarding the ability to break the cipher. Uh, this was a normal Enigma rotor, but with more than one notch on it, and the notch could be easily reconfigured in the field and would have caused irregular stepping of the rotors. Uh, towards the end of the war, 12,000 of these were, were ordered. However, for most of the war, they were not used uh, as the Germans considered an Enigma to basically be unbreakable. unbreakable. So again, the history of Enigma, we have basically talked about its invention. Uh, it's being adopted by the uh, uh, Army and Navy. Uh, the German Navy got those the five rotors, and then the Army and Air Force joined five rotors. Now the Navy says, no, we want more. We're going to go to seven in 1938. And then they added another one in 1939. And the Enigma M4 machine, the four-order variant, uh, was adopted in 1942. Well, folks, that ends the presentation. I'd be happy to take your questions now. Yes, sir. And I'll remind you next week, the lecture is going to cover how they broke the code. What's the sign? Yes. How the nations were able to buy the Enigma machines before us. I'm so sorry. I'm hard to hear you. Were, were other nations able to buy the Enigma machine before the war? Great question. Before the war, the commercial Enigma machine was primarily sold in Germany, uh, but the British got a hold of one from Austria. Uh, the Polish got a hold of the commercial version by accident. It was sent to, to uh, Warsaw, not noted as being a diplomatic machine. Uh, they got a phone call They please do not open up this machine. So obviously it was a weekend. They opened it up, took it apart piece by piece, uh, got the wiring of the wheels, and put it back together. And that allowed the Polish to actually break Enigma when it was a three-wheel machine and only three, three rotors, only three rotors available. They were breaking Enigma messages from the 1930s on. In 1928, when the Army adopted their Enigma machine, you could not buy one of their versions of the machine without specific permission from the Army. What was the durability of the machine out in the field? Very durable. The, the, main, the main problem with it, two, two issues with it. One's the battery would run down, uh, and two, the lights would go out. So if you look at the Enigma machine that MS Rowell is talking up to bring, uh, you see we got a series of extra lights uh, to put into the machine. So otherwise, it was just a mechanical machine. It was very durable. The, the rotors uh, were made of either bake light or metal. They were four inches. The interior wiring was secure. Uh, everything, really very durable machine. Transported very easily and uh, used in the field, used on the boats. Very durable. Other questions? Yes, sir. These decoders of Gulfstream Park, they had to be very fluent in German, right? Absolutely. Well, well, the, the, the people that were breaking the codes had to be very fluent in German. Uh, we'll cover that next next lecture, but basically what they would do is they would guess a part of the message, depending on where the message was coming from. Weather stations were a great one because they would always identify themselves as weather stations such and such in the message. So they would try, and that would be a crib, and they would use that crib to try and break the message. Once, the mess, once they found something that looked like it worked, they would go into uh, Enigma Simulator, type out the whole message in German, and then somebody had to translate it back into English. And they had to translate it 
determine whether that message was useful or not. But it was a too late or just totally unimportant. You know, they had one guy that consistently sent the same message every day uh, from the field, nothing to report. So, <laughs> They may think that was bad, but they knew when they got that message, they now have a great crib to start breaking messages with us. Yes, sir. And we'll go in the back. Did they, did they determine being a little more practical than we are, but not as advantage? We always throw a lot of stuff in, like the beautiful Monday, Army V, Navy, and then you, or whatever, in, in this person. Did they do that in the full world? Did they do that in the messages? The Germans really didn't send stuff like that too often. The weather reports would would obviously cover weather weather issues, uh, but there were people. There were people. For example, one of Rommel's aides. Every time he sent an Enigma message, he would end it with Heil Hitler. So as soon as they saw the message was from Rommel's aide, they knew the ending code was Heil Hitler. They had a crib. Uh, no, some of, some the whole of the, world wants to know where Task Force Forty Two is. Yeah. Uh, now they could have very easily the, the way Bletchley Park wrote the code could have been totally destroyed. Had they randomly put a, a letter somewhere, you know, every fifth or sixth letter, just put some random letter in there, and then the, the cribs would never have matched up. Yes, sir. I assume that the uh, messages were sent in Polkdeutsch rather than the Irish Bavarian code. Uh, in so the Second World War, you did, you did what? There's a difference uh, between the Bavarian dialect and the High German dialect. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, it's it's a it's a very different than Bavarian dialect and German dialect. Uh, I don't know if the dialect made that much difference. I mean, they were hopefully both speaking German. I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with it with the with the, with the language enough to answer that question. Okay. Yes, sir. I want in your translation of "Welcome to the World." The translation was kind of cool. Sorry. The translation was kind of cool. We had to make sentences. You had to make sentences out of it. Yeah, the, the, uh, uh, we, we had a, a slide that uh, sort of showed that. We go back, uh, go back to the slide. Uh, into my coded messages. You'll see that they are four-letter groups. So you didn't know where a word ended and where a word started. And as you know, some of these German words can be very, very long. Uh, so the people uh, had to be able to break that. Yeah, that's why you had people at Wetchwick Park who were chess masters, crossword puzzle enthusiasts, uh, and uh, mathematicians. They were all involved in looking at this stuff. So, okay, that's a German word. Break it here. This is another German word. Break it here, etc. So it wasn't an easy operation. And a, lot of, a lot of technical German words don't translate. I'm sorry? A lot of technical German words don't translate. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. This man. I'm just wondering about how the operator works because you have to push those down quite a bit. It's not like a typewriter where you can just sort of do it uh, easily. I grew up with a very old typewriter. You had to push it down quite a bit. Oh, <laughs> but yeah, you have to push that letter down. And once you do it, it's going to light up the whiteboard almost instantaneous. Uh, you know, Mr. Gills may, may wish to demonstrate that for you uh, for those of you who want to stick around after the lecture. Any other questions? Can we go back? Sorry, can you go back to the welcome where it shows in four letters? So well, this is it. Yeah, no, but where it's welcome, where it, it, it goes back to uh, welcome. Well, it says welcome right there. It says, uh, it says, welcome to the World, welcome to the World, World War II Museum. The original message. That's well, the original message. And so where this is, is how this is how it's ciphered into four letter groups. And then it's deciphered then into four letters. He deciphered it into four letter groups. But he knew German, so he could okay. very quickly figure out what, what, what were words and where they ended with it. So, yes? Since they were on subs and the field, it had to be transmitted with shortwave radio, right? They were transmitted by a radio, and those signals could be captured because it's a radio signal that goes all over the world. Now, you can imagine the difficulty, you know, if you're trying to capture the message and you miss one letter, you know, you get a U for a V or something like that, that's not, that's not going to decode uh, properly when you try to break the, break the initial message. Uh, so people who were reading these messages that would be interfered with by weather uh, come here and they're all wearing them across the English Channel when they're capturing these, these codes. So a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of potential problems that can make it difficult to actually get get all of the messages. Yes, sir. There's one thing, remember these guys did it every day. 
I'm sorry? Like the, these guys did it every day. That's right. So the signalman on an aircraft carrier or on a battleship who sat at a typewriter and listened to different, his frequency, he did that eight hours a day. And he was typing whatever letters the Morse code came in. By day, it was by dash. He just sat there and typed away. But what he could kind of tell, it doesn't make sense. Oh, he's speaking German again. <coughs> He may not be able to speak good German, but he, oh, that's French, why? Oh, you want or whatever. Now, wait a minute, that's random. And he had a way to do the paper there, and that went to another group of six guys. So that every ship in the United States Navy, and every ship in everybody else's Navy, they were getting pretty far on all of this stuff. The problem is that's what had to be so complex. The question about breaking it is not a question of can it be broken. The question is how long is it going to take you to break it? If the guy says, I'm inbound on the bomb target, you better be able to break it fast. If he tells we're, you we're going to talk, we're going to talk next week about uh, how quickly they were able to break the messages. Yeah. One thing you need to be aware of is there wasn't one Army net, one Navy net, and yeah. one Air Force net. There were 120 different networks that they had to break. I mean, throughout the war, some of those networks went away, like the Shark replaced Dolphin when the Navy went to Fort Rotor. But there were a lot of networks they had to break every day. Yes, sir. Mr. Mill, I'm just curious. How did you learn all this stuff? <laughs> I have done a ton of reading, and I've been fortunate enough to. Uh, you, know, you see, some of my some of my uh, information here is based on my shades by George Bruce Jeanette. I was able to talk to him via email. We exchanged a lot of information where I was able to understand exactly how it worked. I hope I was able to get that to you without too much confusion. I hope so. I know it's very confusing. Uh, I, I've probably read eight or nine books dealing with code reading. Okay, so we're wrapping up. We are. So well, let me let me finish with just one comment for you guys. There were 107 thousand million 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 ways to set up the Enigma machine, and typically the code was broken the next day in the morning using 1940s technology. <coughs> it is now almost 80 years later. How secure do you think your password is? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. And we hope you'll be back next week to hear the uh, remainder of her presentation. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Oh, and make sure to come and visit the uh, Enigma machine we have set up in the front of the room. You want to take a closer look.